Hello, this is Nikki Going. Welcome to session eight of our discussions on the Crucible. Today we're going to be discussing Act Four, and I'll start off by giving you a brief overview of what happens in this act. It's always very important that you have a complete understanding before you begin. Um, just some things to notice that by the end of Act Three, we've come to a point in Salem where a good reputation and accusing others of witchcraft is the currency of power. Ironically, people who are honest and have integrity are those that get convicted. Liars, on the other hand, are believed and treated like saints. The original power hierarchy in Salem is almost, has been almost completely overturned and inverted. And Proctor makes a final emotional break with Abigail and sides completely with Elizabeth. In this act, we can see that what we are dealing with is a great love story as well as a great tragedy. And you can actually read this play as a battle between the forces of death and evil and love and life and goodness. So in, in Act 4, we find out that at the beginning of the act, Salem is such an unhappy place that it has become like hell. In fact, characters like Tichuba and Sarah Good actually would prefer to be in hell than be in Salem. Hale sees the court as entirely corrupt. He's been hanged. He has been trying to get the prisoners to confess to witchcraft so that they will not be hanged. There are rumours of a rebellion against the court in neighbouring Andover. Mercy Lewis and Abigail have run away after Abigail robbed Paris. Paris begs Danforth to postpone the hangings, but Danforth refuses, despite the fact that he now has absolute proof that Abigail is a liar. Paris is also desperate that the convicted prisoners confess to witchcraft. Not because they're innocent, not because he's a good man, not because he knows that the courts are corrupt, but because he's worried that he will be killed by the angry people of Salem if they are hanged. Paris describes how he found a knife stuck in his door. Hale also begs for a postponement of the hangings for very different reasons to Hale, to Paris. Sorry, He wants to have more time to convince the, accu the accused to actually confess. Danforth refuses Hale, but he does let him spend the night trying to convince the prisoners to confess. Danforth and Hale ask Elizabeth to try to get John Proctor to confess. Elizabeth says she'll talk to Proctor, but she makes no promises of trying to actually convince him that he must make a confession. Proctor is brought in, and Proctor and Elizabeth are left alone. And this is the start of one of the greatest love scenes in English literature. Proctor finds out how many people have been accused and he finds out that his good friend Giles Corey was pressed to death. Proctor and Elizabeth talk and they finally forgive each other. Proctor considers confessing. He feels that his integrity is lost and he knows that if he confesses he can live and he can be with Elizabeth. He asks her what she thinks and she says that he must decide. But crucially, whatever his decision is, he's a good man and she will never judge him. So at this point, Proctor and Elizabeth have rekindled their love affair, and Proctor tells Hathorne that he's going to confess. Hathorne is overjoyed and calls the court officials in to witness the confession. Rebecca Nurse is also brought in, because the court hopes that Proctor's confession will encourage her to confess as well, but Rebecca refuses to confess. Proctor refuses to accuse anyone else of witchcraft. All he's willing to confess to is that he committed witchcraft which is obviously a lie. Proctor then signs his confession, but when he hears that it will be published and he will lose his name or integrity or good reputation in the village, he takes it back and he rips it up. Elizabeth is devastated because Danforth decides that Proctor is lying in his confession and he must be hanged, and Proctor is taken out, out of the room to the, to the gibbet. Hale begs Elizabeth to get Proctor to change his mind, she refuses. She's decided that she will never take his integrity and self-respect away from him now that he has it back, even if it means that he has to die to retain them. The prisoners are hanged as the sun rises. Elizabeth stands at the barred prison window and she watches her husband die in her final greatest act of love. So some of the major themes we'll be looking at today are the inversion or the turning upside down of the traditional social order in Salem, the layers of reality and truth that exist in Salem, 
so that no one is ever quite certain of what is true, what is a lie, what is real, what is natural, what is supernatural. Who has power in Salem and who does not, which is linked to the importance of reputation versus integrity, because we've reached a point in Salem where one cannot usually have a good reputation and integrity. In fact, a good reputation usually comes at the cost of real integrity. We can see the ongoing battle between the supernatural forces of heaven and hell, and Miller expresses this largely through his imagery. The evidence of witchcraft is again satirized, which of course is linked to the USA and the McCarthy trials that were happening in, in Miller's America of the 1950s. And that is linked to this dualistic worldview, which made the people of Salem so vulnerable to the witchcraft trials. The fact that they separated everything into absolutes of good and evil, right and wrong, heaven and hell, for the court and against the court. And of course we see the ongoing battle between Abigail and Elizabeth for the soul of John Proctor. So some of the imagery that's used is imagery that ties into that supernatural battle between heaven and hell. We see imagery that's linked to the inversion of the social order. We see the presentation of the ideas of purification either by fire or by water, which of course is linked to the imagery of pollution by the spilling of blood. And how does one get rid of that pollution? How is one absolved of that sin? Miller also makes use of biblical imagery. Again, it's linked to this idea of a supernatural battle between heaven and hell. So some of the stories that we will encounter in this act are the story of Joshua commanding the sun to stand still, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, and the white banner of purity that was often depicted as something carried by, by Christian saints. So when we get to the setting of this act, we find out that this act is set in a cell in Salem jail that fall, in darkness, but for the moonlight seeping through the bars. And it will probably look something similar to this photograph, although it may have had wooden walls. Note that the setting is in darkness, and most of the action happens at around about midnight, ironically the traditional time for the committing of witchcraft. Also, darkness, as we know, symbolizes threat and death and evil, which is very appropriate for the actions that are going to occur in this, in this act. Also notice it's only six months since spring, which happened on the farm in Act 2. And uh, fall here is an American word meaning autumn. So that means that in six months, we've gone from John and Elizabeth Proctor being free, along with the majority of the people in Salem, to literally hundreds of people being charged, arrested, and several having already been hanged. The psychological setting of Act 4 is also very, very important. Um, and it's all about this turning upside down of the social order and the rising sense of chaos and disorder and threat in Salem. So there are images of chaos and social upheaval everywhere. For example, the act opens with Sarah Good and Tichiba. They both seem to have gone mad, and they say they would rather be in hell than in Salem. The marshal of the jail, Herrick, is drunk. The jail is filthy, overcrowded, and very badly run. Danforth walks in and comments, there is a prodigious stench about this place. And of course that's ironic because it can also be seen as an image of moral corruption, the stink of immorality. Hale says that orphans wander from house to house because so many people have been arrested and jailed that parents have been imprisoned and there is no one to feed the, or look after their children. Normally socially respected men such as Hale and Paris are behaving very strangely and out of character. People with terrible reputations, Hale refers to them as harlots, which are prostitutes or whores, are able to successfully accuse honourable people of witchcraft. Everyone in Salem is in a state of heightened tension and paranoia because they're terrified of being accused next. Hale says no man knows when that harlot's cry will end his life. And there is talk of rebellion against the courts in the neighbouring village of Andover. Cows are wandering the streets, unmilked, bellowing in pain, and farmers are fighting about who they belong to because their owners are all in jail. Cheever says there be so many cows wandering the high roads, now their masters are in the jail, and much disagreement who they belong to now. 
So we can see that this is a society that is on the brink of collapse. It's in a state of absolute chaos. There's been a complete breakdown of law and order. And as I said, crops are rotting in the field and the stink of rotting crops hangs everywhere. Again, that image of rot and decay. So we get to this idea or we open with this idea that hell is better than Salem, which is a really powerful image. And of course, it's linked to that imagery and those themes of the layers of truth and reality and the inversion of social order. Also look carefully at this section in terms of who has power in Salem and who does not. So Herrick, the uh, court martial arrives to clear Sarah Good and Tichaba out of the prison cell because Danforth wants to have a meeting there. He has arranged to meet with Paris and discuss Paris's odd behavior. The women speak about how they long to go to hell because hell is warm and because the devil is kinder in hell than he is in Salem. And it's such an interesting idea that the devil has been made more evil and more bad tempered by Salem, not the other way around. For Tichaba, the devil is the kind ruler of Barbados, the island where she originally lived and where she was taken captured as a slave. And Tichaba, as I said, seems to have gone mad in prison. When she hears a cow bellowing outside, she thinks that Satan has arrived to collect her and take her home, and she's very excited. Which is a really tragic comment on the way that Tichaba has been treated in Salem society and the comfort that Christianity has brought to her. She would rather be in hell i.e. Barbados, um, ruled over by Satan than in the supposedly Christian and heavenly society of Salem where Christianity has been used against her to accuse her of witchcraft and where the devil that rules over her is Paris. Tichibus uh, says, Oh, it be no hell in Barbados, Devil, him be, him be pleasure man in Barbados. Him be singing and dancing in Barbados. It's you folks. You rouse him up round here. It be too cold round here for that old boy. He frees his soul in Massachusetts. But in Barbados, he just a sweet and... And a bellowing cow is heard and Tichiba leaps up and calls to the window. Aye, sir, that's him, Sarah. And Sarah responds, I'm here, Majesty. And both of them imagine that they're talking to the devil and that the devil has come to rescue them from the horror of Salem. And notice here how the imagery of cold and freezing is associated with Salem, but the imagery of warmth seems very attractive and is associated with hell and the devil. And Herrick grabs Tichuba and hustles her along. Come along, come along. And Tichuba resists him. She doesn't want to go. She wants to go with the, with the devil instead. She says, no, he's coming for me. I go in home. And Herrick pulling her to the door says, that's not Satan. It's just a poor old cow with a hat full of milk. Come along now, out with you. And Tichiba calls out the window, take me home, devil, take me home. And it's such a tragic reflection of just how sad and brutalized she has become. And Sarah, following the shouting Tichiba out, shouts, Tell him I'm going, Tichiba. Now you tell him Sarah Good is going too. So Proctor had seen all along that the courts were inver inverting the social order in Salem. And he had warned the courts and warned the people of Salem. In Act 2, he said the little crazy children are jangling the keys of the kingdom, which implies that Children like Abigail and the girls were now controlling the entry to heaven and making life and death decisions about their neighbors. At the end of Act 3, when Abigail is at the height of his, her power, he says to Danforth, you're pulling heaven down and raising up a whore, again showing how the places of heaven, which should be occupied by Elizabeth, is now being taken over by Abigail, who's personified as a whore. So you can see how this inversion has happened almost completely and it's an indicator of how the battle between the supernatural forces of heaven and hell are going because at the moment it seems that the real heaven is on the losing side although what is presented as heaven which is what is presented as goodness in Salem seems to be on the up and up. So before the witchcraft trials heaven was seen as good now People like Tichiba and Sarah Good see hell as good. 
God was seen as good and was seen as the protector of good people. Right up until Act 3, Proctor was telling Mary Warren, God never sleeps. And remember the angel Raphael, do that which is good. And he's basically telling her, if you do what is right, nothing bad will happen to you. And he, at the end of Act 3, Proctor loses that faith and he says, God is dead. And it seems that liars control the courts and Salem and most of the people with integrity have been arrested and they may even be hanged. So before the witchcraft trials, Christianity was seen as good. Now Christianity has led to suffering and to evil to the point where Hale says that wherever he looks with his eye of faith, blood has sprung up. Before the devil was seen as evil, now Tichiba and Sarah good long to be with him. Before the imagery associated with heaven and Christianity, that imagery of coldness, whiteness and purity was seen as good. But we can see in this act that the imagery associated with, sorry, that should be hell and the, de and the devil, which is heat, red and black, is seen as more attractive. Initially, most people thought that it was easy to distinguish between good and evil. Remember Danforth's comment in Act 3, We live no longer in the dusky afternoon where evil mixed itself with good and befuddled the world. But we can see by Act 4 that evil and good are thoroughly mixed up. No one can tell the difference. And in fact, society has become chaotic. Proctors, you're pulling down heaven and raising up a hall is a clear indication of this. So Danforth comes into the jail cell that um, Sarah Good and Tichiba have just been cleared out of, and Danforth asks Herrick if he's drunk. Herrick explains that it's so cold that he's had to drink to keep warm. And again, this idea of cold being bad is being reinforced. Danforth wants to know why Hale has been allowed to see the prisoners, because he's no longer an official of the court. You'll remember at the end of Act 3, Hale ended with the words, I denounce these proceedings, I denounce this court. And Danforth is puzzled when he's told that Paris has actually authorized Hale's visits. We found out that Paris has been acting very strangely. He and Hale have been praying with the prisoners together. And when you consider that Paris has been solidly behind the witchcraft trials the whole time, and Hale is very definitely against them, this seems very odd. Danforth asks about, uh, uh, says about Hale, Paris prays with him. That's strange. And Paris has also been seen to be acting strangely in the streets of Salem. Hale says about Paris, I met him yesterday coming out of his house, and I bid him good morning, and he wept and went on his way. I think it is not well the village sees him so unsteady. So it seems as though Hale, uh, Paris too is going a little bit mad. So Paris comes in and Danforth and Hathorne question him about why Hale is at the prison. As I said, they find it very strange that he would now be working with the court and working with Paris after he denounced all of them at the end of Act 3. So Danforth says, Reverend Hale has no right to enter this, and he's going to say prison, but he's interrupted by Paris who says, Excellency, a moment. And notice he hurries back and shuts the door. He doesn't want Hale to overhear what he's going to say next. So Hathorne asks uh, Paris, do you leave him, that's Hale, alone with the prisoners? And Danforth asks, what's his business here? And Paris prayerfully holds up his hands. Excellency, hear me. It is a providence. Reverend Hale has returned to bring Rebecca Nurse to God. And of course, that's laden with irony because we know that Rebecca Nurse is the only person in the play who has never turned away from God. She has remained consistently faithful and Christian throughout the play. And of course, the idea of, of Paris being prayerful and um, good is also deeply ironic. Uh, Danforth is surprised. He says, he bids her confess. And Paris says, hear me, Rebecca have not given me a word this three months since she came. Now she sits with him and her sister and Martha Corey and two or three others. And he pleads with them, confess their crimes and save their lives. And the fact that Rebecca and Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse's sister are actually willing to even listen to Hale and speak to him is an indication that Hale hasn't actually lost his integrity. His reasons for getting them to try and for trying to get them to confess are different to Paris's. And Danforth is really pleased. This is why this is indeed a providence. And they soften, they soften. Paris, unfortunately, not yet, not yet. And Paris is now in a complete panic. 
You'll remember that he started off being an enthusiastic supporter of the trials by the end of Act 1 because he had decided that if he supported the witchcraft trials, he could cement his power in Salem and he could appear to be God's man on earth. But now he tries to ask Danforth to postpone the executions. He says, I thought to summon you, sir, and look at how broken his speech is, how stressed he is. I thought to summon you, sir, that we may think on whether it be not wise to, and he dares not say it. I thought to put a question, sir, and I hope you will not. He can't even get the words out. And Paris goes on to describe how Abigail and Mercy Lewis have run away how Abigail stole his whole life savings of 31 pounds from his locked strongbox and has left him broke. And now that Abigail has been proved to be dishonest, Paris knows that the witchcraft trials will have even less support than they already do from the people of Salem. So he says, there is news, sir, that the court, the court must reckon with. My niece, sir, my niece, I believe she has vanished. This be the third night. Excellency, I think they'd be aboard a ship. And Danforth stands agape. You can imagine what's going through his head. This is his star witness. She's run away. She's stolen. She's been proved to be a thief and a liar. All the court's evidence uh, pretty much comes from her testimony. She's been accompanied by Mercy, Mercy Lewis, who's another star witness. Um, and they plan to run away. So how can he now substantiate the charges against all the people that he's imprisoned, some of whom he's already hanged. And Paris continues, My daughter tells me how she heard them speaking of ships last week, and tonight I discover my, my strong box is broke into. He presses his fingers against his eyes to keep back tears. You know, and you might be thinking, Oh, bless, he's weeping because his beloved Abigail has run away. I think it's more like he's weeping because he no longer has power and he's lost all his money. Always remember how greedy Paris is. So Paris is weeping. Is it because he's lost his reputation? Because he's terrified of the people of Salem? Because the witchcraft trials are going to be seen as flawed? Or is it because he is now absolutely penniless? And as I said, Danforth is facing a disaster. He has proof now that Abigail has always been dishonest, that none of her testimony or that of Mercy Lewis can be trusted. And of course, the village will know about this too because they haven't been seen for three days. And yet he chooses to continue with the witchcraft trials. So he deliberately ignores the truth. He deliberately ignores the fact that the court is hanging people that are innocent. Paris knows that there's a growing rebellion against the witchcraft trials. He suggests that maybe Abigail ran away out of fear that people would attack her because they no longer believed in her honesty or that of the courts, um, which is a bit uh, of a problematic assumption given that she stole all his money. He discusses the open rebellion against the trials in the neighboring town of Andover and Paris says, mark it sir, Abigail had close knowledge of the town and since the news of Andover has broken here, the rumor here speaks rebellion in Andover. I tell you what is said here sir, Andover have thrown out the court they say and will have no part of witchcraft. There be a faction here feeding on that news and I tell you true sir, I fear there will be riots here. Sorry, there's a duplicate slide. Um, so we can see that, that the normal order of things has been completely inverted. And now there is another power shift in Salem. And again, it's got a lot to do with who does and doesn't have a good reputation and who is able to best manipulate the truth. So Hathorne objects that everyone in Salem has been very satisfied with the witchcraft trials and, ha and hangings. He says, riot? Why at every execution I've seen naught but high satisfaction in the town? And Paris explains that the people agreed with the executions up to this point because it enabled them to get rid of the social outcasts of Salem. However, now that people who were respectable members of Salem society have been charged, and have been hanged, and more are lined up to be to be hanged, they uh, no longer support the courts. So Paris says, Judge Hathorne, it were another sort that hanged till now. Rebecca Nurse is no Bridget that lived three years with Bishop before she married him. John Proctor is not Isaac Ward that drank his family to ruin. And he says to Danforth, I would to God it were not so, Excellency, but these people have great weight yet in the town. Let Rebecca stand upon the gibbet and send up some righteous prayer, and I fear she'll wake a vengeance on you. 
It cannot be forgot, sir, that when I summoned the congregation for John Proctor's excommunication, there were hardly 30 people come to hear it. That speaker discontent, I think, and, and of course he's interrupted. So just to remind you, excommunication, ex means out of, communion means in community with. So excommunication is an official ceremony where a church expels someone from the church. And Puritans believed that if they were excommunicated, they would go to hell after death. So this was a really terrible form of punishment to condemn someone to death, to hang them and to execute, excommunicate them before they died so that they would definitely burn for eternity in hell. And this is what Paris um, has supposedly done by excommunicating um, Proctor from the Puritan church. He's guaranteed an eternity of hellfire. And of course, it was also seen as a way of purifying the church. So excommunication is also linked with that imagery of the crucible and of fire being a purifying element. So we can see again, power has shifted in Salem. Right at the top, Danforth, he makes all the decisions. No one dares question him. And he's supported by Hathorne. Beneath him, there's Paris. But we know that Paris's power is somewhat threatened. He's terrified. Um, they're the Putnams. They're the remaining girls. Presumably, they're also feeling quite nervous now that Abigail and Mercy Lewis have run away. Beneath them are Hale, Proctor, Corey, and Nurse. Then Elizabeth, Martha, and Rebecca. Notice that Tituba is still right near the bottom. She's always been a victim of racism and slavery. And despite the fact that she testified in the trials, her social position hasn't improved. And right at the bottom are social outcasts, Sarah Good, Goody Osborne, and Bridget Bishop. Of course, Abigail and Mercy Lewis have realized that they were going to lose their power altogether, so they've run away. And the court continues to ignore the truth. Danforth says that, um, they will, that, that Hale and Paris must try to get the prisoners to confess. But if they can't, the executions will still be carried out as planned at dawn. Paris says that the executions cannot and must not go ahead because his life is in danger. He says, tonight when I opened my door to leave my house, a dagger clattered to the ground. There's silence as Danforth absorbs this. And then Paris cries out, you cannot hang the sort. There is danger for me. I dare not step outside at night. Notice, you can't hang these innocent people because there is danger for Paris. Paris is scared. So... Although it seems that Paris has changed his position, and he has, he no longer wants to hang people for witchcraft, he's unchanged in that he is still 100% only interested in his own self-interests. He only wants to save his own life. He's still completely selfish. Danforth says, um, sorry, this is a duplicate slide. I'm so sorry. Um, so Paris and the court are now desperate for Proctor and the other prisoners to confess because this will validate the witchcraft trials. The more people that confess, the more likely it looks to outsiders that the trials are actually uh, carrying out justice, that witches do exist and that evil has been identified and is being prosecuted. Um, so the court is pleased that Hale seems to be working with them in trying to get the prisoners to confess. And Paris tells Danforth, now Mr. Hale's returned, there is hope, I think, for if he brings even one of these to God, that confession surely damns the others in the public eye, and none may doubt that they are all linked to hell. This way, unconfessed and claiming innocence, doubts are multiplied, many honest people will weep for them, and our good purpose is lost in their tears. So if they hang people like Rebecca Nurse, if she hasn't confessed, people will see her as going to the gibbet like a saint. They'll see her as an innocent martyr who refused to lie. And um, this will increase the resistance against the court. So Hale comes in and he argues that the hangings at dawn mustn't go ahead. He spent the whole night trying to get the prisoners to confess to witchcraft and he's failed. And he says to Danforth now, you must pardon them, they will not budge. And Danforth remains absolutely stubborn. And he presents ridiculous arguments about why the hangings must go ahead as scheduled. And it's these arguments that allow Miller to satirize the 
evidence of witchcraft and also the way that the courts operated in the USA of the 1950s under the McCarthy trials. So Danforth sounds very conciliatory, very sort of forgiving and understanding when he speaks to Hale. He says, you must understand, sir, I cannot pardon these when 12 are already hanged for the same crime. It is not just. And Hale begs for more time, but Danforth insists that nothing will change his mind. Danforth says, now hear me and beguile yourselves no more. I will not receive a single plea for pardon or postponement. Them that will not confess will hang. Twelve are already executed. The names of these seven are given out and the village expects to see them die this morning. Postponement now speaks a floundering on my part. Reprieve or pardon must cast doubt upon the guilt of them that died till now. While I speak God's law, I will not crack its voice with whimpering. So just consider his logic, logic, or lack thereof. He says, if people have already been hanged unjustly, it would be unjust not to give the same unjust punishment to those who have been unjustly condemned. So that's a kind of argument of let's take injustice and make it just by adding to it. Um, he says, if he issues pardons or postponements, it will look as though the judgments he's already passed are flawed. Yes, it will, because the judgments he already passed are flawed, but he doesn't want to admit that. And he says he represents God, the Puritan church, theocracy, and the court. Therefore, he's the voice of God. Therefore, he cannot be wrong. Therefore, he cannot be seen to be wrong. That's why he says he will not crack the voice of God by floundering. Um, and this applies even though he knows for a fact that his star witnesses, Abigail and Mercy Lewis, are actually liars and the evidence cannot be trusted. So he's just basically rewriting reality, rewriting the facts. And you can see how um, this is a complete inversion of the social order and also an inversion of heaven and hell, lies and truth. So Danforth, as I said, refuses to change his mind. He's arguing that if people are on the side of God in heaven, they'll work with him and the court, and they will be doing the will of God. He says, if retaliation is your fear, know this. I should hang 10,000 that dared rise against the law, and an ocean of salt tears could not melt the resolution of the statutes. Now draw yourselves up like men and help me, as you are bound by heaven to do. So just some quick definitions. Retaliation is the desire for revenge and statutes are written laws that apply to organizations. They can also be the laws of God. So the imagery Danforth is using here is imagery that taps into uh, water imagery that's being used throughout the play. So Danforth talks about an ocean of salt tears that could not melt the resolution of the statutes. Remember Paris describing how people would feel about the hanging of the innocent. He says, honest people will weep for them and our good purpose is lost in their tears. Remember Proctor promising Elizabeth in Act 2, I will fall like an ocean on that court, fear nothing Elizabeth. And he told Hale in Act 2 that he was a Pontius Pilate, God will not let you wash your hands of this. So you can see that this imagery of water, which is being used by Danforth, is ironically linked to the idea of purification, of bringing about truth, of mourning the innocent. Because water is used in religious ceremonies to purify people of sin. And tears or salt water symbolize suffering and the purification of people through their suffering. And of course, oceans are overwhelmingly powerful. So here, Danforth is emphasizing his extreme stubbornness. And he also says he'd hang 10,000 people. And he probably would, given half the chance. This is not a man who changes his mind. So Hale asks Danforth again, please postpone the hangings. And Danforth refuses again. And Hale pleads with him. He says, Excellency, if you postpone a week and publish to the town that you're striving for their confessions, that speaks mercy on your part, not faltering. And Danforth says, Mr. Hale, as God have not empowered me like Joshua to stop the sun from rising, so I cannot withhold from them the perfection of their punishment. Now, perfection here means that it's perfectly appropriate, perfectly just. It also means completion. So Danforth implies that he is God's instrument, carrying out God's will by continuing with the hangings. And of course, he's using the biblical story as imagery to support his point. 
he, t he re refers to the story of Joshua. Now Joshua was told by God to, to command the sun to stand still so that the Israelites in the Bible, the goodies, would have enough time to defend their enemies, the forces of evil, the Amorites at Gibeon. Notice though that Danforth says he's not like Joshua. He cannot stop the sun. He cannot stop the sun rising and therefore he will not stop the hangings taking place at dawn of the next morning, which is when they're scheduled to happen. So Hale argues that the people of Salem distrust the, point, the court to the point where they're ready to rebel against it. He says, Excellency, there are orphans wandering from house to house. Abandoned cattle bellow on the high roads. The stink of rot rotting crops hangs everywhere. And no man knows when the harlot's cry will end his life. And you wonder yet if rebellion spoke? Better you should marvel at how they do not burn your province. Notice here how fire is referred to as a purifying element. And Danforth asks Hale if he's been preaching against the witchcraft trials in the village of Andover. And Hale says that he's grateful that the people of Andover don't need his help because they've already rejected the courts. So um, Danforth is puzzled. He wants to know why is Hale working with this court when he so clearly already rejected it. And Hale says, excellent. Oh, sorry. Um, And Hale says, why? It is all simple. I come to do the devil's work. I come to counsel Christians that they should belie themselves. And then he can't carry on being sarcastic. There is blood on my head. Can you not see blood on my head? And you can imagine what a terrible moment this is for a minister, an ordained priest of God, that he is actually coming to tell Christians that they must lie so that they can save themselves from the unjust convictions of a Christian court that is supposedly doing the work of God. And he feels massively, massively guilty. Um, so Danforth decides to see if Elizabeth, if Elizabeth can get Proctor to confess. And Herrick comes in with Elizabeth and Hale tries to convince her to get Proctor to confess. To confess. And Hale says, you know, do you not, that I have no connection with the court. But she seems to doubt it. He says, I come of my own, Goody Proctor. I would save your husband's life, for if he is taken, I count myself his murderer. Do you understand me? Goody Proctor, I have gone this three months like our Lord into the wilderness. I have sought a Christian way, for damnation's doubled on a minister who counsels men to die. So Hale is worried that he has damned his own soul because he has been instrumental in the hanging of so many. And... Um, he cannot bring himself to counsel people to continue to say that they didn't commit witch, witchcraft if this means that they're going to be put to death. He feels guilty for their sentencing. Um, and he says that he thinks of himself as their murderer. And Hathorn gets really indignant. He says, it is no lie. You cannot speak of lies. And Hale says, yeah, he knows these people are innocent. It is a lie. They are all innocent. Danforth, I'll hear no more of that. And um, Danforth uh, allows Herrick to come in with Elizabeth and Hale tries to convince her to um, get Proctor to confess. He says to her, let you not mistake your duty as I mistook my own. I came into this village like a bridegroom to his beloved, bearing gifts of high religion, the very crowns of holy law I brought. And what I touched with my bright confidence, it died. And where I turned the eye of my great faith, blood flowed up. Beware, Goody Proctor, cleave to no faith when faith brings blood. It is mistaken law that leads to sacrifice. Life, woman, life is God's most precious gift. No principle, however glorious, may justify the taking of it. So here, he's, not only is he saying that the church is wrong if it condemns anyone to death, that only God should have the right to take uh, someone's life away, but he's saying something absolutely terrible about his religious faith that his religious faith has led to death, it's led to suffering, it has led to the shedding of innocent blood, and he actually regrets his faith, he's lost faith in his own faith. And of course, that image of spilt blood, when he says he has blood on his head, it's an image of guilt, um, and it's linked to that idiom um, where a person says, on your head be it, and they mean that uh, whoever's head it be, it being blood, they are guilty or responsible for a decision. 
So Hale is saying that he's guilty of the bloodshed that's happened in Salem so far. So we've got to ask ourselves, why does Hale decide to work with the court? It's not that he supports the court, he doesn't believe the court, he thinks the court is completely wrong, but he thinks that this is the only way to save people's lives. And if he saves people's lives by getting them to lie, he feels he's doing the work of God. Um, if he doesn't get them to lie and, and confess to a witchcraft they didn't commit, then that, in fact, would be a sin. Um, and in fact, he sees not lying as committing the sin of pride. And Elizabeth, of course, is very cautious about a religious man twisting the words of the Bible to suit his own purposes. She's seen uh, Danforth and Hathorne and Paris do it over and over again. Um, so she says to him, I think that might be the devil's argument. So Hale says, I beg you, woman, prevail upon your husband to confess. Let him give his lie. Quail not before God's judgment in this, for it may well be God damns a liar less than he that throws away his life for pride. Will you plead with him? I cannot think he will listen to another. And that's when Elizabeth says, I think that this be the devil's argument. And of course, this is linked to that imagery where Hale described himself as being like Jesus uh, in the wilderness, because Jesus went into the desert and fasted for 40 days to prepare himself for his ministry so that he could defeat the devil and do God's work on earth. And Hale says he's been praying for weeks so that he can do just this, so that he can get people to lie. Of course, Elizabeth is alluding to the possibility that Hale is not like Jesus, but that Hale is like the devil tempting Jesus and tempting her and goodness. So Elizabeth does agree to speak to Proctor. She refuses to weep in front of Danforth when he asks her to convince Proctor to confess. And of course, Danforth sees this as further proof she must be a witch. She says she'll talk to Proctor, but she won't promise to try to convince him to confess. So Danforth asks her, be there no wifely tenderness within you? He will die at the, with the sunrise. Your husband, do you understand it? And she only looks at him. What say you? Will you contend with him? She is silent. Are you stone? I tell you true, woman. Had I no other proof of your unnatural life, your dry eyes now would be sufficient evidence that you delivered your soul to hell. Have the devil dried up any tear of pity in you? She is silent. Take her out. It profit nothing she should speak to him. Notice here that Danforth is linking Elizabeth with the imagery of hell and the devil. But of course we know that in this inverted social order it's actually Danforth that's evil. And Elizabeth says very quietly, let me speak with him, Excellency. Everyone leaves and Proctor and Elizabeth are now alone. And this is the start of, as I said, one of the greatest love stories in all of English literature. Look at Miller's description of the moment when John and Elizabeth Proctor see each other again for the first time in months. Now, they've both been in prison for a very long time. They haven't bathed. They haven't eaten. Proctor has um, been tortured. He's probably covered in dust. In blood they probably both stink and this is what happens alone proctor walks to her and halts it is as though they stood in a spinning world it is beyond sorrow above it he reaches out his hand as though towards an embodiment not quite real and as he touches her a strange soft sound half laughter half amazement comes from his throat he pats her hand she covers his hand with hers and then weak he sits then she sits facing him so they just have that moment of physical contact where they're just reunited and loving each other. And then they have what seems like an ordinary conversation between a husband and a wife. Proctor asks about her pregnancy and she says that she's well. He asks about his sons and she reassures him that they're well and that they're living with Samuel Nurse. But their conversation also has some really dark and terrible aspects to it and it's an indication of how abnormal Salem is because Proctor finds out that Salem is in chaos. Elizabeth asks him and finds out that Proctor has been tortured. She goes on to tell Proctor that over a hundred of their neighbors and friends have been arrested and that many have confessed to witchcraft, although Rebecca Nurse has not. And then he finds out about the death of Giles Corey and they mourn Giles Corey together. Now remember that Giles Corey was described by Miller as a deeply innocent and brave man. And you can see this in the way that he died. 
So Giles Corey refused to deny or admit to the charge of witchcraft. When he was asked whether or not he was a witch, he wouldn't say yes or no. And so to get him to confess, they put huge rocks on his chest, which was called pressing. Um, and eventually the, pre the weight of the rocks made his ribs break so that they collapsed inwards and punctured his lungs. But he technically died a Christian because he hadn't actually confessed to or against witchcraft. And because he died a Christian, his son was allowed to inherit his farm instead of it being auctioned off by the state. And we find out that Martha Corey also refuses to confess. So Elizabeth explains, it is the law, for he could not be condemned a wizard without he answered the indictment, A or nay. Great stones they laid upon his chest until he pleaded, until he plead, I or nay. And then she gives a tender smile for the old man. They say he gave them but two words, more weight, he says, and died. And you can imagine he was ornery and contentious and difficult to the last. It would have been very satisfying that he made them so angry with his final words. And Proctor's numbed. This is a thread to weave into his agony. More weight. And of course, remember that Miller was writing about real people and real events. Giles Corey was a real person. And you can, if you go to America, to Salem, you can actually see his grave today. That's his gravestone on the left. It says Giles Corey pressed to death, September the 19th, 1692. And the picture on the right shows you a picture of how pressing was done. So a plank on the chest and then more and more rocks. So Proctor and Elizabeth discuss whether or not Proctor should confess. And Proctor says he wants to confess because he's already lost his integrity. When he committed adultery, he lost his integrity. And he feels he would be a hypocrite if he died for the truth. And everyone thought that he was like a saint and dying like a saint or a martyr. But Elizabeth will not agree that Proctor has no integrity now. Proctor says, I cannot mount the gibbet like a saint. It is a fraud. I am not that man. Notice? She is silent. So whenever she can't agree with something, she just keeps quiet. My honesty is broke, Elizabeth. I am no good man. Nothing spoiled by giving them this lie that were not rotten long before. And Elizabeth says, and yet you have not confessed till now. That speak goodness in you. And of course, Proctor and Elizabeth are gradually falling in love again. Proctor says he hasn't confessed up until this point just because of spite. He despises the court and its judges. He doesn't want to make them happy. And then he asks Elizabeth to forgive him. So here he seems to be apologizing for his adultery and also the suffering that it has caused, including Elizabeth's arrest and potential hanging. Proctor wants Elizabeth to see his decision not to confess as honest, which is quite paradoxical. Um, so remember, paradoxical, it seems to be contradictory, but it tells a greater truth. Um, he wants his confession to seem honest because he is lying um, but he is actually not pretending to be a good man. He argues that if he is hanged, he will still go to hell as God has seen his sins and his children will still be homeless. So there is no point in getting hanged. He says, I'd have you see some honesty in it. Let them that never lied die now to keep their souls. It is pretense for me, a vanity that will not blind God nor keep my children out of the wind. What say you? So he feels that he's already lost his soul. He's lost his integrity. If he died on the gibbet, he would be lying and pretending to die as an honest man when in fact he is not. So paradoxically, lying and confessing is an act of honesty. Elizabeth tells John that she loves him and has forgiven him because she sees him as a good man. But she says he must make his own decision about confessing. But to her, he always has integrity. So Elizabeth, upon a heaving sob that always threatens, John, it come to naught that I should forgive you if you'll not forgive yourself. And now he turns away a little in great agony. It is not my soul, John, it is yours. He stands as though in physical pain, slowly rising to his feet with a great immortal longing to find his answer. It is difficult to say, and she's on the verge of tears. Only be sure of this, for I know it now. Whatever you do, it is a good man does it. And he's asking her a terrible question. Should he die and, as far as she's concerned, save his soul? Or should he live and be with her but lose his integrity and probably his self-respect? 
So Elizabeth then asked Proctor to forgive her. She blames herself for his adultery, which is called lechery. She wants Proctor to realize that she's not perfect either. She says, I have read my heart these three months, John. I have sins of my own to count. It needs a cold wife to prompt lechery. And Proctor seems to be in great pain. He says, enough, enough. And Elizabeth's pouring out her heart. She says, better you should know me. And Proctor, still in great pain, says, I will not hear it. I know you. And Elizabeth says, you take my sins upon you, John. And Proctor's in agony. He says, no, I take my own, my own. So they have this little argument about whose sin the adultery was. But it's also a declaration of love. Neither one of them wants the other to suffer for that sin. Elizabeth says she's always treated Proctor with suspicion and a lack of affection because she could never believe that he could actually love her. She says she was never beautiful enough or never felt beautiful enough to be loved by him. And notice that she describes her lack of sexual interest and her treatment of Proctor in terms of the imagery of cold. She says, John, I counted myself so plain, so poorly made. No honest love could come to me. Suspicion kissed you when I did. I never knew how I should say my love. It were a cold house I kept. And of course, at that point, when they have made up, they've reached the pinnacle of their relationship, Hathorn enters and she swerves round in fright. And Elizabeth reminds Proctor, do what you will, but let none be your judge. There be no higher judge under heaven than Proctor is. Forgive me, forgive me, John. I never knew such goodness in the world. And she covers her face weeping. And it's such a contrast to the last time when she said she forgave Proctor in Act 2. And Proctor rounded on her and said, oh, Elizabeth, your justice would freeze beer. After Elizabeth has declared her love and acceptance of Proctor, no matter what he decides, he decides he's going to tell Hathorne that he'll confess. And Hathorne's overjoyed. He runs into the passage and shouts out to everyone in the prison that Proctor's going to confess. Proctor still isn't sure that he's doing the right thing, and he tries to decide by asking Elizabeth what she would do. And Elizabeth just keeps saying she refuses to judge him. So Proctor says, well then, who would will judge me? And he clasps his hands. God in heaven, what is John Proctor? What is John Proctor? I think it is honest. I think so. I am no saint. Let Rebecca go, go like a saint. For me, it is fraud. So he can't wrap his head around the, this idea that in order to be honest, he has to lie. Would you give them such a lie? Say it. Would you ever give them this? And she cannot answer. You would not. If tongues of fire were singeing you, you would not. It is evil. Good then. It is evil and I do it. So he's been honest with himself. If he lies and confesses to witchcraft, he's doing wrong. But he's going to do it anyway because he feels like he is evil. So Danforth tells Proctor that he must sign a written confession for the good instruction of the village and it will be posted on the church door. Proctor starts his confession, but all he will confess to is having seen the devil. He won't admit to anything else. And um, it's ironic that Paris, Hathorne and Danforth are also pleased that a prominent member of the Salem community is confessing to witchcraft. You can see how the normal order of things are completely upside down. So Danforth says, did you see the devil? And Proctor says, I did. Paris, praise God. Proctor confesses to him having seen the devil, as I said, but that's it. And then Rebecca Nurse is brought in. And the idea is that she's going to be influenced by Proctor's good example and be persuaded to confess as well. And she refuses. And Proctor is utterly humiliated by her courage. And I think this is the point at which he starts to doubt his decision to confess. So Rebecca brightens as she sees Proctor. And you can imagine, oh, John, you are well then, eh? And Proctor turns his face to the wall. He's so ashamed, he can't even look at her. And Danforth says, courage, man, courage. Let her witness your good example that she may come to God herself. Now hear it, goody nurse. Say on, Mr. Proctor, did you bind yourself to the devil's service? And Rebecca's astonished. Why, John? And Proctor says through his teeth, his face turned from Rebecca. I did. It's so incredibly hard for him to say this, to give this lie. And Danforth says, now, woman, you surely see it profit nothing to keep this conspiracy any further. Will you confess yourself with him? And I think when Proctor realizes he's actually undermining Elizabeth Nurse and his neighbors with his confession, that's probably another reason for doubt. And Rebecca says, oh, God, oh, John, God send his mercy on you. 
So even in this betrayal, she's still kind. And Danforth says, I say, will you confess yourself, goody nurse? And Rebecca says, why? It is a lie. It is a lie. How may I damn myself? I cannot. I cannot. And you can see here that she remains that standard of loyalty and truth. She will not lie. And Danforth starts doubting Proctor's confession because Proctor says he only, he's only confessing so that he doesn't die like a saint. He also refuses to judge others and he refuses to condemn Rebecca Nurse despite Danforth's constant badgering that he do so. Proctor says they think to go like saints. I like not to spoil their names. So Paris tries desperately to get Danforth to accept Proctor's confession. Ironically, Hale also tries to convince Danforth. Hale quickly says to Danforth, Excellency, it is enough he confessed himself. Let him sign it, let him sign it. And Paris, Paris says feverishly, because Paris wants to survive, It is a great service, sir. It is a weighty name. It will strike the village that Proctor confesses. I beg you, let him sign it. The sun is up, Excellency. So, of course, Proctor is getting another reminder, ironically from Paris, that his name is going to be used to validate these witchcraft trials. And Danforth reluctantly agrees to accept Proctor's confession. And, but when Proctor's given that confession to sign, he refuses. He argues that the court can testify that he confessed, and he doesn't see why he has to sign a written confe confession. Eventually, he does reluctantly sign it, but then he won't give it to Danforth. And he says that the reason he won't hand the confession over is he will not let the court use his good reputation to validate the trials that he knows are corrupt. He says he will not let them use his name to blacken the names and reputations of innocent people. Notice again that imagery of blackness and soiling and hell. He argues that he can never deserve his children's respect if he betrays his friends. He says, no, no, I have signed it. You have seen me. It is done. You have no need for this. I have confessed myself. Is there no good penitence, but it be public? God does not need my name nailed upon the church. God sees my name. God knows how black my sins are. It is enough. You will not use me. I am no Sarah Good or Tichiba. I am John Proctor. You will not use me. I have three children. How may I teach them to walk like men in the world? And I sold my friends. Now notice the imagery. Proctor says here, God does not need my name nailed upon the church. God sees my name. God knows how black my sins are. So he's implying, first of all, that this court is not doing the work of God. He's also linking his sin to blackness. But there's been a change in his religious attitudes. At the end of Act 3, he said, God is dead. Here, his old faith that God sees everything seems to have returned. And perhaps he even believes that God ultimately will um, do the right thing by him because he has been faithful. Danforth says, you have not sold your friends. And Proctor says, beguile me not. I blacken all of them when this is nailed to the church the very day they hang for silence. And Danforth responds, Mr. Proctor, I must have good and legal proof that you, Proctor, you are the high court. Your word is good enough. Tell them I confessed myself. Say Proctor broke his knees and wept like a woman. Say what you will, but my name cannot. And Danforth accuses Proctor of not signing so that because he says he's planning to deny his verbal confession once he's been freed. Proctor says he won't deny anything. And when Danforth insists on a reason for Proctor refusing to sign, Proctor explains how important his integrity or his name is. And he says if he signs his integrity or his name away, he won't know who he is anymore. And then he might as well be dead. So he says with a cry of his soul, because he knows this is his death sentence, because it is my name, because I cannot have another in my life, because I lie and sign myself to lies, because I am not worth the dust on the feet of them that hang. How may I live without my name? I have given you my soul. Leave me my name. Danforth asks if Proctor's confession is a lie. He tells Proctor that if Proctor doesn't give him an honest written confession, Proctor will be hanged. And so Proctor responds by lunging for him, grabbing the confession, tearing it and crumpling it up. Danforth calls the marshal to take Proctor to the gallows. Hale's horrified and tries to stop Proctor. He shouts out, man, you will hang, you cannot. And Proctor, whose eyes are full of tears, and I think he delivers these lines with a huge sense of relief, says, I can. And there's your first marvel that I can. 
you've made your magic now for now i do think i seems i see some shred of goodness in john proctor not enough to weave a banner with but white enough to keep from such dogs and of course he's highlighting the irony that the court has finally found magic they've finally actually cast a kind of a spell because it is through the court that Proctor is finally able to see some goodness in himself. He's finally able to regain his integrity. So when he says, um, I do not, I do think I seems, I see some shred of goodness in John Proctor, not enough to weave a banner with, but white enough to keep from such dogs. He says he's found shreds, little bits of goodness in himself that he can weave together to create a basic covering of self-respect. It's not as big as a banner. And remember, a banner or a flag represents pride in a person's identity. Um, the Christian stories talk about saints in heaven with white banners, which symbolize their purity. So Proctor says he doesn't have enough self-respect or purity for that kind of a banner. But he does have enough to make sure that he will not cooperate with his court. So this is the last great moment of Proctor and Elizabeth's love story. Elizabeth, in a burst of terror, rushes to him and weeps against his hand. And she says, give, and he says, give them no tear. Tears pleasure them. Show honor now. Show a stony heart and sink them with it. And he lifts her and kisses her with great passion. And of course, that's their last kiss before he dies. Rebecca tells Proctor not to be afraid. She says they will face a different sort of court in heaven, presumably one that is just. Rebecca says, let you fear nothing. Another judgment awaits us all. Danforth then orders the execution. He says, hang them high over the town. Who weeps for these weeps for corruption. And Proctor helps Rebecca out of the room. She's almost collapsed. And she says it's because she's so faint um, because she hasn't had breakfast. She's probably also terrified, but very brave. Paris and Hale plead with Elizabeth to save Proctor by getting him to confess. Hale says, woman, plead with him. It is his pride, it is vanity. And she just avoids his eyes and moves to the window. He drops to his knees. Be his helper. What profit him to bleed? Shall the dust praise him? Shall the worms declare his truth? Go to him, take his shame away. And of course, here we see this imagery of a loss of faith in faith. Because when Hale says, shall the dust praise him, shall the worms declare his truth, he seems to have lost all his faith in religious faith. And he uses the imagery of death and decay here and doesn't mention a heavenly reward for goodness or integrity in the afterlife. So it's, he's basically saying that if Proctor dies because he does the right thing, it's utterly pointless and it's a sin of pride. Hale, of course, doesn't realize that Elizabeth has already taken Proctor's shame away. And that's why he took the decision to die rather than lose his integrity and self-respect again. And that it was Elizabeth's last great act of love for Proctor that she let him die. She didn't try and stop him. And you can see that she's, she's almost dropped from the horror and the sorrow of it. She says, supporting herself against collapse she grips the bars of the window and with a cry says he have his goodness now god forbid i take it from him and she clings to those bars and she looks out the window as her husband is hanged so the final stage directions tell the audience that they are in fact hanged because drums were played while the condemned were hanged and they had been scheduled to hang at sunrise so the directions are the final drum roll crashes, then heightens violently. Hale weeps in frantic prayer and the new sun is pouring in upon her face and the drums rattle like bones in the morning air. So a couple of questions just to consider at the end of the play. Did Abigail and the court in Salem actually win? Did Proctor gain anything by his death? Do you think he's a tragic hero? If evil was defeated in this play, who defeated it and how did they do it? Do you think it's worth dying for a principle or to keep your integrity? And how and why do you think Abigail was allowed to get so powerful? Why do you think the witchcraft trials happened in Salem? And just a little uh, footnote, Miller notes that after the hanging of, the pe of people that included Proctor and Rebecca Nurse and these people that had a really good reputation in Salem, the people of Salem were so unhappy that they rose up against the court and they actually threw it out of Salem. So um, it's a footnote to the play that in fact 
Proctor and Rebecca's deaths did bring about the downfall of the court.